Hi, welcome. Hi so I want to introduce you all. My name is Adam Strom, and I'm the Executive Director of Reimagining Migration. And one of the co-founders of Reimagining is Carola Suarez Orozco, and a professor at UMass Boston, actually a distinguished professor <laughs> counseling at UMass Boston. And she's really done very, very deep work over the years thinking about the life trajectories of immigrant kids. So I thought Carol and I have a little bit of a conversation about Ephraim Divided and things that we might be thinking about before opening up the book to our class. So I want to start, Carol, by thinking about the, the center story of Ephraim Divided is this really wonderfully tight-knit, mixed-status family, you know, where the kids are U.S. citizens, the parents are undocumented. So how familiar is that story in the United States? Oh, it's very familiar. There's about a million uh, students in the country under the age of 18 who are undocumented themselves. And then there's about another four and a half million who uh, are citizen children, but who's, uh, who have one or more parents who are undocumented. So that's about five and a half million kids who are touched by uh, unauthorized status. So it's a very common pattern. What would you want teachers to know about their lives? Well, the, many of these children and families have been here many years, you know, uh, most of their childhood, uh, 20 years. So they've, they've established roots in our communities. Uh, they, uh, are, they work hard, they are uh, very much wanting to be part of the American community. Uh, but we've, we've had a, a, a stalemate in Washington in uh, coming to terms with uh, normalizing uh, the issue of, of immigration. We just haven't been able to kind of break that through. Um, and so families have been caught in limbo for long periods of time. So, uh, and, and, and as a result of that, families are living with, uh, with the possibility that at any moment, a member of the family could be uh, swept away uh, at, and, and, and not be there at the end of the day. So, you know, I talk to children who uh, worry that when their father is being, dropping them off in the morning, uh, that he might not be there at the end of the day. Uh, so that is a lived reality for five and a half million kids. Mm. And, that, and that's, that's Ephraim's story. He, sh he comes home from school and mom's gone. And his brothers and sisters are with, with, a, with a neighbor, right? So as we think about this role and then our own role as educators, how, how, how might this knowledge guide our relationship? There's a scene in the book that I think is very interesting where a teacher sort of wants Efren to tell this, the, him his story. And I'm thinking a lot about, I think a lot of us feel like we could be helpful if we knew our kids' stories. But I know that with an undocumented family, there might be some concern there. So tell me, what role should we be playing as educators in this moment? Well, I think the first thing is to be aware that this is not an uncommon pattern, that it is very possible that you have a, if you are a teacher, you have a, at least one student in your class who is touched by undocumented status. There are parts of the country where it's more common. So if you're in Los Angeles or you're in Bakersfield or you're in parts of Texas or you're in Chicago or you're in parts of Florida or you know, in, in certain parts of the country, it's gonna be even more common, but this happens all over the country. So it is possible that you have a child who is undocumented. So that's, that's premise number one. So if you wanna be a sensitive educator, know that you may have children who are encountering these kinds of dilemmas, who worry about whether their parent will be there at the end of the day, not because their parent isn't responsible, but because they may be swept away at any moment, uh, caught in the, in, you know, in the, counters of the of the immigration system. So that's 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 premise number one. Premise number two is that um, trust is a big worry in in these families. 
and while we are good educators want to encourage conversation and uh, divulging details of, 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 of lives uh, as part of getting to know their students, uh, it's not always uh, safe for uh, children to share uh, details about their lives. They're worried that if they say the wrong thing or if they say too much, uh, that they may be uh, compromising the safety of their family members. So I think it's very important that educators not push children to say more than they're ready. So, it, you know, the best thing you can do is be kind, uh, be open, uh, but don't push and don't ask. I'm not, and I'm not saying don't ask, don't tell. I, I certainly think you don't, should never tell, but you, uh, you shouldn't be asking directly. Um, because you you don't know whether the you know what the child is able or willing to to uh, to to pass along. Thank you. So the other piece of this right is the nightmare happens in this book, mm. where where mom is taken away, and it strikes me is that this is a story that's related to lots of stories about family separation, some voluntary and some not, right? And maybe voluntary probably isn't the right word. So, so what should we as educators know about that experience? And again, recognizing that not only is it an idea that we should know something about, but again, potentially some of our kids have had that experience as well. Well, one thing I would say that is that family separations is extremely common as part of the migratory journey. So I did a study of 400 immigrant kids uh, who came from Mexico, China, the Dominican Republic, Central America, and Haiti. So all very different places. And these were all, you know, on average 12 years old. And we, we were, they were all newcomers. And we were all, in, we were interested in hearing about their immigration uh, voyage. Their, and, and, and then, to, and we followed them for five years to find out how they, adjusted and you know what were some of the predictors of their doing well or some not doing as well as we hoped in, in, in terms of you know integrating. Uh, and so the first year we asked the parents in one in an in a separate interview with the parents, tell us a little bit about your migration story, who came first, who came next, etc. And we did the same thing with the kids. And what we learned in that and these were, let me back up and say, all of these kids were recruited from schools. So these weren't kids that we were recruiting from clinics, family clinics where the families were coming in for, with, with the crises. These were just average kids in schools. And what we found was that more than 75% of the kids had been separated from their family members from anywhere from six months to five years mm -hmm. uh, prior to the migration. Um, and so it, it was it, it, it was a very common kind of process and there were co very complicated reunification processes along the way. So that and that is a you know voluntary voluntary I think is a, a, a you a you put your fingers or wiggled your fingers around that. It's voluntary is probably too strong a word. I, families uh, leave their children behind for a period of time because they're, going ahead, doing, you know, and, and trying to settle in, find a job, get things put together, uh, arrange the, the, the papers, get things in order. They, so the idea is to get everything set up and then bring the children. And people think it's gonna take a little while and it often takes longer than they're hoping for. Um, and then sometimes families give up that it's, they're, they're gonna be able to regularize their papers in time before their children have completely grown up. And then they'll send for their children because they don't wanna see the entire childhood of their children uh, go by without see, being with them. So uh, that's, that's a, that is a common pattern. Now, what we're talking about in, in NFCON's case is that this is a uh, separation that is imposed by our federal system, right? Uh, our, the government has decided that uh, they will come in and impose a sep family separation onto the, the family. Um, and, and that is, you know, an even more complicated. It's already, it was already pretty complicated in the other situation, but this is 
you know, the trusted, you know, we hope that children grow up to trust their government. Um, and here, in this case, the government is the one who comes in and says, we're taking your, your mother away for reasons that children don't understand. Um, or they take away the father who may have been the principal breadwinner and, and, and it pulls the family into deep poverty. So not only is the, uh, there the emotional loss of, of the loved, beloved parent, but there's also, uh, you know, tremendous, it, it, it really precipitates deep poverty in many cases. Um, and food insecurity and housing insecurity and all those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and, and it's from people that in uniform that, they sh that we would want our children to trust. So it's a very complicated and difficult process for lots of reasons. So yeah, well, I think well, very well said. And in this case, right, we, we watch Efren's role change dramatically. This 12 year old all of a sudden has new responsibilities mm -hmm. for his family, right? And mm -hmm. the father really has to lean on him. So it changes not only his relationship with the siblings, but his relationship with, with his parent as well. Right. So one of the things that comes up a lot is this dilemma about the resources that we teach and the resources that we share with our students. So there's a concern, I think a legitimate concern people have that books can be, or storytelling could ask, raise trauma for mm -hmm. people this may have spoken to the content. And then of course, there's the other end of this, which I think is just totally legitimate as well as, but on the other hand, it can help some people feel seen. I know Ernesto Cisneros, that's part of what he's doing is he, he wants people to be seen. So, how would you, if you're an educator, looking out at who might be in your classroom, make a choice about approaching a book like this? That is uh, the $1 million question. There, it, there isn't a simple answer on this one. I think that it's important to teach these kinds of books for a couple of reasons, for a couple of audiences, for children who are growing up in families or communities where these kinds of things are happening. Uh, it's extremely important to be seen and all of a sudden not feel like they're the only ones. And often, I mean, these are not uh, narratives that people share. There's often a lot of shame caught up in these, uh, in these dilemmas and situations. Uh, and so to suddenly realize, oh, I'm not the only one that this has happened to. Uh, is an extremely important process for uh, you know, kids in those situations. So there, that's number one. Number two, um, I think that the the issue of unauthorized and undocumented status is is simplified and and divisive, and um, and polarized in this country. And a lot of people who are not familiar with the situation, uh, you know, uh, go to the oh they're they chose to be illegal. And I'm, I'm putting using the illegal term because that's the pejorative that is used by people who don't understand. Um, and and this, is, this is an opportunity for some insight and some empathy and some uh, uh, imagination of, of what it would be like. So it's a perspective taking an empathy tour for people who don't come from those, um, those kinds of situations. Uh, so it's, a, I think, an opportunity for raising awareness. Now there is the possibility of, of triggering trauma. And that is something that I can understand where teachers would worry about. Uh, and I, and there were, so there are a few things that you can do. Uh, one thing is you wanna make sure that absolutely no teasing, name calling, uh, silly things coming out of uh, peers mouths happen. So I think that you need to start the conversation by saying, we're gonna talk about a situation that some people go through. This is something that happens to a lot of people. So you're normalizing it by saying that. This happens to a lot of kids in, this, in our country. And, uh, and it may ha happen to someone in this class. I don't know and I don't need to know. Nobody needs to say anything. They don't have to volunteer information. If they want to, they can have a, come and talk to me quietly and privately. But uh, uh, nobody has to say anything they don't want to say. But I want you all to know that this could be ha this could happen to anyone in this classroom. 
or to some members of our classroom. So we need to set ground rules about how to be respectful about this. So what, uh, you know, so ground rules around no teasing, no calling names, no, if anyone does share something that it stays within the classroom uh, because trust is really important and there are dangers involved. So if uh, something gets leaked to a teacher in another classroom home who might not be quite the same level of ally, or if a, a kid goes home and talks to a parent who may not be quite as much of an ally, there are some dangers involved. So I think this is to teach this responsibly, one has to think through these dilemmas. I don't think that means we should stay away from teaching it because it's too important and there are too many people uh, who are impacted by it. But uh, we do need to think about how to do it responsibly. Thank you, that's really helpful. I'm interested in just a quick response to this. That as somebody who, as I read this book, and I think about my own family story. I think that the family, there's multiple family separations in my family story, mm -hmm. right? Half of, half of my great grandparents came to this country separately from their spouses, from the, their mm -hmm. children, right? It's normative uh, with migration. It's not the same, but it strikes me as interesting. The other thing that I think about is that at the time that most of my family came, for people who had their identities, there were no quotas. There were no mm -hmm. laws. They didn't actually even need passports to come. And so it just strikes me that a little bit of a historical perspective may be helpful in, the, in these conversations. So do am I being loose with the history? Am I not understanding the, mo the current moment as you think about my personal reflections? Oh, I agree 100% that uh, there's a, theme of continuity around family separations being part of the of the experience of migration. Uh, what is what has changed is uh, the how undocumented status has come about. So 100 years ago, you know, during the, the, the great the big migration from 1880 to 1920, the the way people were excluded uh, was around usually health issues. So glaucoma, tuberculosis, some sort of health issue was the was how Unless we were Chinese. I mean, oh well, okay. yeah. Well, that's that's another, yeah, of course. Um, but those those are classic ways people were excluded. Uh, and then you know, uh, then we started setting quotas around countries, and um, and 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 then we we were about ready to regularize things right before uh, uh, George, uh, George W. Bush's administration was about to try to regularize our messed up un, you know tangled uh, system and then 9-11 happened and since that time we have not been able to get any kind of bipartisan conversation going to solve this problem and so as time goes by, more and more and more and more people have been here for, for decades without having been able to regularize themselves. And I do think that sh should be part of the conversation. I don't think it's a conversation that'll, that you know, eight-year-olds will understand, but it certainly as kids get older, and, and certainly it's part of teachers should know this, right? That the undocumented status issue is not simply people choosing to break the rules and 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 do illegal things uh it is a, a function of a system that's broken you know and and you know i've heard so many times well why don't people get in lines my grandparents got in lines well the lines were you know very different and much more functional than they are right now thank you so much carola i think i hope that as you, educators as you watch this you might think about how you take in this information, digest it a little bit, and think about how you might prep for your classes, what considerations might you have, what contracting might you uh, do. Uh, and as you teach this, I mean, I think this is an extraordinary book. So enjoy, enjoy the conversations with your students. Thank you so much, Carola. Thank you. It was an honor and a pleasure. Enjoy the book.